Um, I didn't realize that um, we're gonna get the mention for the different project. Yes, I do uh, hack on knitting machine, but I'm not talking about that. But if you're curious about it, I'm happy to chat afterwards. Um, hi, my name is Mariko. Um, that's my Twitter handle. And um, I just tweeted a slide, link to this slide. So if you wanna look at it on your computer or phone or something, um, you can just check that out. I am a JavaScript developer at a company in New York called Scripto. Uh, we make real-time collaborative writing software for TV shows. So. If you're working on similar kind of project, I also love to chat. Um, and also, I'm a co-organizer of user group in Brooklyn called Brooklyn JS, which is kind of like exciting to get invited to Thunder Plains. Like they have like active user groups and like they have conference, and I'm kind of jealous of them having conference. Like I want to do conference, um, but I'm also a co-organizer of Brooklyn JS. Uh, I'm talking about language, and specifically the how to take care of language issues, because believe it or not, there was issues, to help your projects in times. So a little bit of history about like how I came to this um, ish, um, topic uh, personally. I learned English as an adult. I wasn't born as an English speaker. I was born in Tokyo as a Japanese person who's speaking Japanese full time. And we did have like six years of public education, but it wasn't enough for me to get to conversationally speaking and doing presentation. In fact, if you ask me 10 years ago saying like, you are going to be speaking at a developer conference in US in English, I would just say like, no fucking way. <laughs> because I didn't speak in English. I studied English because I wanted to go to um, college in US. So I kind of like did come in for six months of ESS, uh, ESL education to get enough points to go to college in US. So as I mentioned, like, you know, I would not imagine speaking at a dev conference because I did not, like coding wasn't my natural thing. It wasn't like, oh, I got this computer at a young age and I was totally thick. Like, no, not at all. Um, I actually grew up in kind of like technical household, but I wasn't ever really interested in coding. And coding is something I picked up Four years ago, or three and a half, four years ago, I moved to New York. Um, and because of my visa status, I couldn't get a job. And before that, I was kind of project manager at a tech, tech company. So I was comfortable talking to developers about like architecting the systems and you know, budgeting for the project and things. But uh, I was never really the person who wrote a single line of code. So I was like, I might give a try. And especially if I learn to code, the next time I go back to job as a PM, and when developer says that feature takes two weeks, I can just say like, no, no, it's gonna take two days for you. So I was like, I'm gonna learn myself to code. So great, right? So now I speak language that is widely used. And then I like code, which we sometimes think that it is universal. Like code is universal. There's a single language. Anybody can write a code and do a thing and contribute to the open source project or um, co collaborate with like all over the world. But intersection of those two was a lot of confusion and frustration learning to code and in the context of using English and then kind of contributing to an open source project. I um, kind of help do a Node.js um, global globalization working group. Um, one thing I found was that like, yes, we do discuss like in English is the universal language and code is also universal. But like this strategy of like one size fits all does not really fit in the things. And you get, you if you are coming out of GNOME, then you find a lot of things kind of misfitting to uh, what is normal. Um, and many people like attending th conference like Thunder Plains are aware of this like same thing as a diversity, like, you know, Diversity, you need to be aware and you just need to work it, work it to make it better. It's not like it's not going to disappear or replaced by something. You just need to be aware those things exist and make it better. So my talk is about like, hey, here is my experience of like outside the gnome and this hear me out because nobody really talks about those things. So a little bit of like how my experience of being kind of outside of coding and English was. Much like few, uh, uh, newer developers who came into coding past four or five years, I learned to, or I taught myself by online learning. And in my case, it was kind of a strange situation. I moved to the US 
Um, Japanese dev community has rich, you know, there have publication, there's a lot of books published, there's user groups and all of that, but I was kind of removed from it. And I was in, sitting in this apartment in New York, very like in winter, it was like snow blizzard, and I was like, okay, the things accessible to me is online, and online education back then was mostly in English. So, you know, this is a screenshot of Code Academy, but I did a tutorials. I went to this bookstore in New York, so, which is even like, I live in the big city in US that had specialized bookstore for Japanese books. So I already had like privileged access to that. But then this is the just the shelf of tech books. And you can see how many PHP and MySQL books are there. Clearly some kind of a WordPress developers living in New York. But um, there's one J uh, two jQuery books and pretty much no JavaScript specific books. And I was like, all right. That's okay, I'll just do that. And I had a conversation with a organizer of JSCO of Columbia, and they were mentioning about how there's no good written resources in Spanish. And they were kind of have a similar experience to mine, which is like coming to learn to code, but then like first barrier is using in it, like uh, learning in English, which I thought it was funny because, you know, living in somewhere like New York, being in um, Spanish and uh, for Spanish as first language and being bilingual with English and Spanish is like very common thing. But then Spanish is, I think, is the second most used language in the world, but then they still uh, suffer from the same issue that I have. Um, on top of that, so I did this, I'll just talk until the slide comes back. But I did this like tutorial on finally in English, um, and I totally got that, like how to write functions, how to um, do my variables. Uh, I know what it does, but then the question that I had was like, why is it called function? Why is it things called argument? Why is variable called variable? Because those terms are not a everyday conversation English term that you use. Like, you know, if you think about it, when you, even you speak English as a second language speaker, um, you don't think the way, say, like, oh, I'm thirsty, so I'm going to invoke the go to store function. Here's my argument. I'm thirsty. That's not the way the English language write it. And kind of like to me, if you look at it, that each of the functions and variables and arguments are English words, but then that's climbed into different syntax and different grammar to do something, which is in this case JavaScript. So I was like, okay, that's all right. Um, so I got comfortable with writing JavaScript, and you know, I still don't really know why it's called arguments, but I know Java is a developer, and it was no shop. So I started writing Node. That was almost two years ago, and you know you needed to read a lot of documents because Node was so new, and um, you just sometimes there's no tutorials available. There's no like easy to understand blog posts available. So you just go dig down the documentation. First thing, uh, first of all, like you know, for file system FS. And then go to the first page presented with this beautiful table of contents, which makes nothing to me. And, and I'm like, all right, so I just need to be a file from the local thing and put it in my server. And what's the function called? Very confusing. On top of that, I'm like leading into this doc, and there's a lot of like um, knowledge that's probably makes sense to people who's been doing this, but does not really make sense to people who's coming in. For example, the documents. Why is it in square bucket, the cache? Maybe it's because optional, but why? Like, it, why doesn't it say it's optional? And callback, it's, it's better now, it says callback, but like some documentation just writes CB as if you understand if it's CB, then it's callback. And at the time, I didn't even know what the callback is. And on top of that, the, 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 the language are very confusing to understand. So this is a buffer, and this is uh, my personal experience as of a few weeks ago, because I was writing a talk about buffer, and I needed to understand what this buffer does. So I went into this document, and then like first paragraph, consuming octet streams, and allocation outside of heap. I was like very confused. These are not the terms that I encounter every day as a developer who's making web applications. And I feel like it could be better. But I had a magic tool called Japanese, and 
was to a call Google, which lets me filter the content by language. So I searched no front end, well, in Japanese front end, search filter only Japanese front end. And then I find a blog post from Dev Shop in Japan saying, like, no recommendation for Node.js for front end engineers. And then you go down and um, <laughs> you <laughs> go down there, it explains what the call which was not something provided by any content available in English. So that was like, this is awesome. Learning to, uh, learning new things in my own native language, even though I was very confident bilingual speaker, I would list on my you know, CV saying like I am a you know, business level Japanese uh, English speaking person. Uh, I was like, this is very easy for me. And I was very frustrated that that's not provided in English. And then, when you come into this, you get very comfortable, you go to conferences, you organize a user group, and you talk a lot about things, and here comes the opinions. Opinions are tricky. Opinion in English is very tricky to me. So one example is a thing called isomorphic JavaScript. So here's one incident that happened to me in May, and I think now we came to term about um, the isomorphic JavaScript, the universal JavaScript, In May this year, it was very flashy term to call it isomorphic JavaScript. And you know, some people started talking about like isomorphic is a very misused term, you should say portable. Uh, I was like, mm, okay. And so they were like, this is actually a math term that means nothing in the context of code, like we shouldn't use that. And then some person says like isomorphic is the new semicolon argument. <laughs> made the term saying that if your code is shared and then that's the how architecture works, that's called isomorphic. I don't really doubt the choice of the word, just like input in my database saying like, okay, isomorphic, that sound and meaning, and that's it. I don't doubt that where it comes from, where it actually means, and I'm like, cut me a little slack, like if I'm, you know, talking to, uh, talking about opinions at a, um, yeah, so so I really have this like kind of ongoing, a little frustration about like, using English in code. And I came to realize that like, the platform that we use every day to code and deploy is not really suited either. Here's an example of one repo. Uh, Lambda also created a programming language entirely in Arabic. And because it was programming language in Arabic, he named the repo in Arabic. And how GitHub handled it is that they changed the name of repo to just dash dash dash. And I came to this article mentioning how GitHub doesn't know what to do with known alphanumeric characters. So I was like curious, so I tried it myself. So I created a new repo, I put Japanese in there, and then it says it still comes back. It still comes back with green check mark saying the phone validated on the front end side, and it says in the comments, says your new repository will be created as dash. To me, it is a very easy way of like, following code validates fine, but then the backend engineers doesn't know me what to do with non numeric characters, and so we're just gonna show it as a dash. And on top of that, they just talk about this like, <laughs> Slide. I wrote it 
I'm raw centric. <laughs> and what was funny is that none of them at the conference thought I, that was Miss Typo. They thought that I was making funny pun about me being angry about the situation. <laughs> Just make it a pun intended. <laughs> uh, so let's, I'm gonna have a few examples of like how to deal with it, my suggestion to how you should deal with it. But let's just look at like one example of the, the, the clue that we have with it. Uh, so I can only speak my experience, so this is my experience. Uh, Node.js, now it is Node.js, like one view from the organization, but when they fork to IOJS, they spin up a internationalization I-18 and uh, working group. So what happened was one day on GitHub issue, my blog just created that anybody who wants to contribute in non-English context, like translating or managing a, um, social media, we are going to add you to uh, organization. We're going to give you working group and then repo to work on. And so just anybody who want to do it, join. Many people plus one it immediately, within a few minutes, and I was one of them. So I plus one Japanese and then like immediately after a person who I work with now in the working group plus one for that. One thing that Michael did, or Michael or uh, I just did the recovery, was that when the, the working group get formed, it came with one issue said welcome. And there was a bullet point of things that you can take on to now as a group. Um, a few things like um, create read me, set a contribution policy, uh, translate blog post, clean a social media. One thing really key to that was that like now you're in charge, do whatever works for you because it doesn't have to blog doesn't have to be medium, it doesn't have to be Twitter. It could be any social media that work for your culture. If you decided to make your own website for your user group, that's great too. If you want to contribute back the translation to the main site, that's fine. Our uh, website working group is going to make it available to switch the language for you. But really, they make sure that this is within the cultural context. Like you can, this is your working group, and you can do whatever best suit for your culture. So at the end of a few weeks, um, most of them are created uh, within a few minutes and a few hours. Uh, the 34 teams are created. So that also shows that like how big this, um, outside of the English context, how big this community is. Uh, 34 teams are created. This is the list of language teams or working groups that was created. Out of 34, 23 became active. And active meaning I just check all of the, um, this, 34 teams and go through the GitHub issues and like see any activities because some of them I don't under, I only understand English and Japanese so I don't know if they're actually active or not but seems to be from GitHub um, activities somebody translated some blog post or somebody created the uh, multimedia um, the, the social media account um, the, the what's known active means that there's one repo and then that's empty like no activities are there but that doesn't mean it's not active. In case of Japanese working, well actually, so let's just show the, um, the active case. So this is the Korean user group um, recently having many issues written about translating a documentation. Here's a Taiwanese group picked up interest in translating and being weekly. So they have a bunch of issues coming in and they actually have a Chinese translation attached to it. There's a Turkish group who is like, so actively um, translating the website and things. And this is just a few examples of what's available and what's visible in GitHub. For example, my team, the, the Japanese working group, moved the conversation off of GitHub and now most of you work on the Slack because Japanese working group or Japanese user group has a very active user base. They have their own website. They already had a Slack channel for their uh, group. So we basically created a new channel in um, their Slack of translation channel and then all the conversation about hey I saw this blog post from Logbag I think it'd be very beneficial if you translated it and share it with everybody and like yeah let's do that and to do that and how to commit that all the conversation happens in Slack like our activity doesn't show on GitHub so I'm suspecting that like many things are happening outside of GitHub but 
but I don't know how to track it. And that's okay too. So this, so far this is a part of experience that um, because not, before none of them paid attention to it and then I just gave the key to do those things and a lot of people participated and joined in the area that wasn't taken care of before in the, this um, one size fits all strategy. The other thing that happened from there was that it became a good onboarding process to the main project. So the uh, screenshot that's coming up soon, hopefully, is the Slack conversation from our group celebrating one of the members getting nominated to collaborators. So Node.js organization has um, kind of um, membership um, tier based on your contribution and what you like authorization in GitHub, like what you can do, like close the issue, so um, do the deployment things. Like there's a, a technical community TSC, and then there's collaborators who has a slightly more authorization than the regular uh, old members. So and that's done by nomination based on like oh hey this person is doing really great work so he should be a collaborator or you can just nominate it yourself too. Um, so Yosuke is a leader of Japanese work, uh, working group as well as he's a leader of Japanese user group and he's been very active translating things but also he also became active in different working groups too. He started submitting a um, proposal for next generation node, which is the NZ working group. Uh, he started very active about diversity working group. So he got nominated for his work. And that all came from my first entry to this language and global vision working group, kind of like starting and moving into more core or what was already existing working group. And then now he became collaborators. Oh, and then, by the way, the FBI, we were celebrating about having a sushi for celebration. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the example of like what was happening and what happened to Node. But you might be thinking, like, my product is not open source. My project is not like widely used. I can't really do like a board 34 new teams and do the same thing. And here is my like, what you can do now suggestion. Um, and many of which are helps non-English speaker to interact with your product or project much easier and much better. But I heard from many native speakers saying that also applies to them. So I really hope this is uh, something that we can both take on to work on it today. So first thing is life is simple and as simple as that. To me, as a context of non-native English speaker, if you throw me a polyglot of English, it's kind of like a JavaScript parser, it's just like a blob of text come through and then like one by one go through and like, you know, kind of like, like puzzling with like what the glamour is that you learn and takes time to lead it. Instead of that, if you can provide me very short step-by-step -step sentence, like bullet points, like TLDR, it's much easier and just get the same message faster. It's much easier to lead. So in case of the buffer document that I had a struggle a few weeks ago, I actually did this one exercise that you do when you are learning English in Japanese, most of Japanese public school, at least I did, and I know many of my friends did, which is write it down, the copy exactly the textbook, what textbook English is, and annotate it, saying like, I don't know that's the word, I don't know what the sentence is saying, and then kind of like deconstruct the polyglot to see what this blob of text means. And now I speak kind of like fluently in English. I feel like this is very tedious, but I kind of like brought me back to the memory of like learning English and I kind of like getting used to how to read English. So kind of this is the kind of visualization of what's going on inside of non-English speaker when they really had to parse one by one and research like what the term is and like what the glamour is and kind of like, oh, because object to like, comes from SV, like verb, sub subject, and you know, all of the parsing effort. The other thing is you can set policy and license for the content. Uh, one thing, the open source pro another open source project called Foodie does this really well. So they have a how to contribute page, which is already nice. They already guide you to how you can get involved. But on one of them are give talks. 
And they basically have like, you're excited about a project? Great. We already have a keynote made two of the topics. And if you want to give presentation at your user group or conference, that's great too. Like, let's just contact us and you can totally use our um, slide. Also, my friend Nolan Lawson, who works on a PouchDB, and he does a lot of open source contribution, and he makes a lot of great blog posts. Uh, his, one of his blog posts got translated into Russian, and he tweeted saying, like, I consider my writing as a public domain, so just, you know, if you want to translate it, just do it. This helps a lot, especially somebody like me, who kind of comfortable with English and who's interested in helping others, or my primary interested in, um, learning to English and learning to code in like native language and all sorts of things. Because a lot of times I really like blog posts. A lot of time I really like project and write to the creator saying like, hey, you had a really great content. Do you mind if I translate it and some, like published it on somewhere? And a lot of times I don't get any response. Or sometimes it, like when the company is doing it, they're like, thank you for your interest. We have no plan of expanding business to Japan, but blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I wasn't really doing business development. I was just offering my help to, you know, help your user because I used it and I know that's beneficial and if it's provided in my native language. So if there's like a written consent already about like you can do this much with my English content, that's great. That same thing, like if you go to open source project on GitHub and if there is no license talk, you kind of like stumble, like step away from using that because you don't really know how much you can use or what you can use. Like having a license helps. And the third thing is improving accessibility. And accessibility means a lot of things. And I'm going to give you a few examples that applies to, particularly to uh, non-native English speaker experience. The readability is everything. Again, like reading English is the same as parsing it. So when parsing is hard visually, like this famous website that we all know. Um, font is really small, contrast is very not so good, the spacing is hard, it's really hard to read. It's almost like I don't go to that side because it's just not, I, I'm interested in the contents that's shared there, but it's just too much work for me to read it. Um, the Node.js documentation, in terms of like readability, it's much better, but it can improve a little more. And actually, I, I had a Twitter conversation about it, uh, how I can contribute back. The code tag that they use, the style for that is too close to the basic font that they use for the website. To me, it does not make any difference between regular text and the code block that they're using. So it's, again, visually when I'm parsing, it's hard to notice like, oh, now this sentence is talking about code, not actual natural language. I find the GitHub, the way GitHub lenders lead me and uh, any markdown content to be very readable. And kind of, this is my default um, style guide per se. Like when I'm designing my own blog or something, I just like go default to what GitHub does um, in terms of spacing and color contrast and fonts and um, the way they kind of put the gray background in the code block. So if you want to implement it, I, from my personal experience, I can tell you that GitHub is very easy to lead. Um, and the one other thing is selectability. And I just made up this word, selectability. Um, so don't do this. The user select none. Just let me text because I sometimes I often don't know what the word is and copy and pasting and Googling it is like totally natural thing to me to do. So you can usually select like so, but if you put no select uh, user select none, then you can't select it. You can't, I can't glove it and I have to type it in those words that I don't really know. And it's worse if something that use like umlaut or something. The other thing is that the highlighting colors, um, I love creative design, but like when you're leading it, if like highlighting, it's very wacky, like blight, orange or yellow or like green and makes it really hard to lead. And I'm gonna show you a diff animation of how I actually lead English content. So one by one, I am scrolling and selecting each word 
and leading it. So the, the, the line that's highlighted is the line I am leading. And this is literally how I lead English text. So you can see it really makes it hard when somebody is like kind of like go line by line leading English and parsing what it is. And it helps, um, visual guideline helps, and the select background is one of the visual guideline. Um, when I'm on phone, I notice that like I lead it on top of the um, phone because there's a line that goes away, right? So um, I just like scroll every text up there and then like only one line that's up top is the line I am leading. And again, that's a visual guideline that I'm just keeping track of where uh, my leading is right now. The first thing is mind the gap. And this is like a lot of like things applies to it. Things like LGTM. We really like to say like, it looks good to me, ship it. But I'm like, why do you use scroll? To sh as a sip is simple. And this is came from a um, source code in Node that literally had a function that named LGTM. So like if you had a contributor who doesn't know what the LGTM is, um, they might be very confused about what the function is. And I find it really interesting. I presented this topic at a different conference and a lot of native speaker came after me uh, after my talk and said like, you know what? I actually always wondered why we use scroll. Like I have no idea where it come from, but like we use it, so I use it. So it turns out like, you know, because everybody's using it, it became a part of vocabulary, but you know, everybody has the same confusion even though, you know, the, the good less of whether it's a native English speaker or a non-English speaker. And last thing is very important to ask what other people who doesn't speak English as a native language need. And the important part is ask for need. The first thing is that you, by asking, you get a consensus of, do you need help? And if that person needs help, then they will tell you what they need help with. If that person is perfectly fine, then they will tell you I don't need help. And the other thing is to get a chance to um, listen to usually unheard voice. So many times, especially at the project like Node, where very vigorous conversation happens, I immersed into this issue. Everybody is posting minute by minute their opinions. And seems to be, it seems like a lot of discussion is happening. And I'm typing my opinion on it. But then it seems like while I am typing and checking my glamours and making sure I don't have typo, the discussion ended. And everybody is like, LGTM, I'm like, I can just deal with it. And then now I'm like, all right, I guess the discussion ended and I'm not, I mean, it's just my opinion and the project moved forward. So I guess I'll just lead what was done later and I'm just gonna, not gonna mention it. It's not like huge bummer or anything. It's just as, as non-native English speaker and then as in this kind of very English centric word, it became normal to me not mentioning it because it's not big deal, because it's not a TSC agenda. It's not a technical thing or anything. So you might be missing out on those little things that people don't mention. So you need to ask and you need to ask often. And don't ever, ever start a conversation with, do you speak English? Sometimes, you know, you can obviously see that person is having some kind of issue with language and you want to help and you want to start a conversation, but you don't really know sure if that you can just start speaking in English. So you just ask like, do you speak English? And check that and then like start it like, explaining things. But like, you don't have to be care about the language part. You should care about what you are missing or what you're not getting. Um, do you speak English really triggers kind of like minority, majority uh, triggers that. So don't start with it. Um, one example of this like asking for needs was uh, Node.js hosted a collaborator summit this summer. And so it was unconference of in-person unconference about project, learning the project. And part of the discussion was internationalization. And a lot of things that was never mentioned before in any of the Google Hangout, any of the issue, something like, we really need you to speak slowly, or we really need you to communicate in written format because it's easier for me to lead it on my own pace. Or bigger, slapid, idiomatic English is very difficult for non-native English speakers. So 
Those things. I was actually talking with a um, core member who contributed the 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 project, and they were very blown away by getting that kind of feedback because it was never mentioned, and they value that that the having discussion in person was great. So just to summarize what we what I covered, um, simple English is very better. Bullet points is amazing. I was actually having a conversation with Ashley Williams this morning, and she's a docs person, and she was mentioning that when you write an English sentence, you write a bullet point to create a, a paragraph or writing or blog post, and then you make it into paragraph of English. But when you're reading it, you're translating back to bullet points because you want to get like what the topic was. So she was like, I don't really understand why you put it into the paragraph. And I was like, totally agree with that. Bullet point is better. Um, and have a content policy, it helps. If it's open and public, it helps to get more contributions. And improve accessibility, highlighting select abilities, uh, and be aware of a culture gap. And ask for needs and ask often. Um, by asking often, you create this like atmosphere and culture of you are not just one size fits all project, you can just constantly remind those who it's not vocal about it often, remind them that like they are also included and welcome too. So if you are kind of curious about what this topic is about and want to dig more deeper, here's a few uh, resources that I can point you to. Uh, one is a talk from GDC this year by Lamy Ishmael about We Suck at Inclusivity, how language creates the largest invisible minority for games. And in this talk, he explains how Arabic language works and how that is creating a invisible minority for games. And this is fantastic. He, he, he did a, such a great job of constructing a talk. It's like fantastic 30 minutes you can spend. And at the end, you were like, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> uh, oh, you might be curious about writing in different language other than English. In that case, you can use FikaScript, which is a, bit, a way to write a JavaScript in Swedish. So the function doesn't mean anything to you because you have to uh, define it in OM in this case. Uh, well, actually, function. Uh, I don't know what OM is. Oh, if is OM. Um, <clears throat> you can do that. If you're feeling more adventurous and move away from, completely away from alphanumeric language, then you can use language called Nadeshko, which is a open source language, uh, I, yeah, language that is um, being around for 10 years in Japan and the book published and there is like decent community around it. Um, developed just for uh, somebody who is native Japanese speaker to learn to code in Japanese. And this is a screenshot from a if statement documentation. So if you are feeling unadventurous and completely want to do this like completely get lost experience uh, in doc in different language or your native non-native language, you can try Nadeshiko. If you, you might be curious about uh, learning about how other people deal with this work. Uh, in that case, Kate Hudson uh, gave a talk at a JSConf 2014 about how they did the localization at a Mozilla's web maker. And she mentions about the design choice that they changed based on the feedback from the localization effort. And going into more technical detail of like encode, how do I implement this um, thing? Then Katie Krokowski gave a fantastic talk at a CSS conf EU this year about using CSS and um, pseudo elements and selector to accommodate those different languages for internationalized or localized website. So I have a link of um, those resources on my slide. You can click on it. Um, this talk wouldn't be possible without having a lot of help, especially Alia, who uh, worked on the um, internationalization module for the Kraken JS at PayPal. And uh, basically, the person who, every time I have a frustration about it, she's a person who is like, yeah, I understand that. It must be, it was just like nice to have somebody who listened to the thing that I feel, always feel like nobody's listening to. Michael Rogers and Jamaya, who helped me kind of get insight into uh, what's going on is Node.js, uh, people I work with, and uh, Vigis, Tracy, and Amanda, who um, kind of entertain this conversation to form it into actual 30 minutes talk. So thank you very much for that. And 
Because I really love blood points, I made my own sticker. I thought it would be funny if I have an election theme, like Obama for America sticker, but like blood point blood blood points for docs. So <laughs> I have 50 of them here, so if you want it, come find me later and then I can give it to you. Uh, again, that's my Twitter handle. That's a link to my slide. I will not have Q&A, but I'm, if you have a question, I'm happy to answer on Twitter or in person today at the party. Thank you very much.